Praise the Lord, everybody. God bless you. Thank you for joining us live this morning for some good preaching. Uh, we're going to have a word of prayer here in just a moment. Uh, just have a word of special prayer. Uh, we do appreciate uh, your support and your kindness throughout these uh, trying times. Uh, we do want to pray as we do pray this morning uh, for the situations around the world, obviously, that are still impacting people's lives and uh, health and uh, our uh, major cities that are facing uh, civil unrest. Uh, we've got a lot to pray about. Amen. Amen. We know the Lord is in control. We know the Lord is on the throne. Uh, we know that God is able. And uh, we appreciate all your support and prayers during this time. I want to mention just a couple things. You may have heard about the, um, the military training accident that took place off the coast of California recently. One of the Marines that, that was uh, killed in that accident was Evan Bass, and he is the grandson of Larry Williamson, um, who is the founder of Reach Out America, one of the leading um, faith-based organizations that has helped uh, in times of crisis. Uh, and we do want to pray for the family of Evan Bass and the other Marines who were killed and injured in that accident. It's interesting because you see a lot of things on the news. Um, I'm just not going to go there, but... Um, but you probably, some of you might not have even heard about this accident that took place. But these are our Marines. These are our, our military forces that are training to defend us. And uh, I believe we should honor them with our prayers. Uh, not just because it's somebody we know, but also because uh, they are worthy of that prayer and support. So we're going to pray for the family of Evan Bass this morning. Uh, that God would be with them and comfort them during this time. And all those others, his comrades. Uh, who were involved in that accident. And let's continue to pray for our military forces around the world. Uh, as uh, was mentioned earlier in this uh, service, uh, there's a lot that goes on that we don't know about in ministry. Well, there's a lot that goes on that we don't know about in military. And uh, we, we need to pray for them. Amen. We'll pray for Sister Joan this morning out with us because she's not feeling well. Uh, we also want to pray for Dustin, who's uh, had an accident and is in need of our prayers this morning. I want you to pray for my little sister who's going to be having a procedure, so we want to pray for her. And uh, Brother and Sister Zeke, Pastor and Sister Zeke, out in the western part of Pennsylvania, uh, recovering from COVID-19, and many others like them. And it was brought to my attention. Um, really, I, I think it's important that we remember those who are in the hospital because uh, they're there alone. Uh, no, no visitors, nobody's able to get in, anybody knows somebody or been there. And, uh, it's been very frustrating for me as a pastor because people go into the hospital uh, with accidents and serious things, and I, I can't go. I mean, it's you, you're, yeah. you just. Now, I had times in the past where I just went, and uh, but trust me, um, they would, they would, they would tackle me because. Uh, so, um, but we can, and it's very frustrating as a pastor, and obviously even more frustrating as a family member, or loved one not being able to get in to see your loved one. So let, let's pray for not just the people that are in the hospital and are sick, <laughs> having surgeries, etc. Uh, but let's pray for their families and, and them that are alone in the hospital. God be with them. Let's pray for those who during this time of crisis, because of obvious uh, business closures and, and, and the strain that's been on businesses, smaller businesses especially, a lot of people lost their jobs. Um, my friend Barb uh, contacted me this week, lost her job. And... Um, I, I just believe God's going to open better doors. I just feel that way. And I told her we'd be praying. And, and she just responded by asking if we'd have special prayer this morning for those people who are alone in the hospital and those people who've lost their jobs. It's, it's a big deal, folks. And, and I feel like we've come against some of the things that have been going on. And, and how many have noticed the foundations cracking in some of this nonsense? And I believe the Lord's at work. Amen. And uh, God hears our prayers. So let's continue to pray and believe God for great things. Uh, and as always, let's continue to remember Bishop and Sister Secrets in our prayers uh, as we continue to pray for them with uh, health issues and things going on in their lives. Uh, honor their service to the kingdom. Amen. So uh, would you stand with me? And you at home that are watching us or wherever you are that have tuned in with us this morning, would you join? Join us in prayer. Uh, we reach out to God because we know that He is able. We're going to hear from the Word of the Lord in just a moment. But I feel like if we could just lift our voices to heaven right now and reach out to God, He knows what we need. And I know there's needs among us. There's needs for you that have tuned in with us right now. We're going to pray to the Almighty God, the one true God, the God who is able to answer prayer. Lord, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you today. We thank you today, Lord, for the grace and the mercy that you've shown to us. We thank you, Lord, because we know it's only by that grace, only by that unmerited 
favor, God, only by that love that you have that we're still moving forward this morning. We pray, God, from around our world that your spirit would move and work in the lives of people. We pray, God, in the midst of civil unrest, your spirit would move and the church would rise up with a powerful force in a mighty way. We pray, God, that you would rebuke this coronavirus in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, that you would break every stronghold that's been grabbing onto it, Lord, and utilizing it, hijacking it for personal gain and purposes, God. We pray for those that have lost their jobs, and you'd open doors that were not there before, God, and make a way that seemed impossible, Jesus. We pray for those alone in the hospital right now. God, they're feeling lonely. They feel like there's hopelessness, God. But you're able to walk into that hospital room, Lord, and you can be the great physician that walks in the door and provides a healing right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Christ, Lord, we believe you today for all these liberty, that we mentioned, Lord, God, that your spirit minister them in peace and strength we believe and healing you, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, God. Jesus God. We pray, Lord, for the family of Evan Bass and his fellow yes, Marines. Lord, pray we pray, God, that you would bless them, keep them, Jesus, surround them with your peace and fill them with your love today, God. We pray, Lord, that you would bless those who serve in military and police efforts, God. We pray, God, that you would enforce them, God. God, as they enforce the laws around us, Jesus. Lord, we pray, God, that your spirit bless them even now as we pray. Lord, let the church rise up in this last day and show the light of God all around the world, Lord. We're the only hope, God. We're the only hope in the world, Jesus, because you're the only hope, God. We, Lord, we lift up the name right now. Come on, somebody, lift up the name of Jesus with me. Lift up the name of Jesus with me. the name the banner of the name of the Jesus name of Christ. Jesus. Lord, we rejoice in the thank power you, of your spirit, God. Thank you, Lord, we thank you today. Can we clap our hands Lord. and magnify the Lord as Brother Franklin comes to preach to us? Come on, church, let's be with it today. Let's get excited today. Let's believe God today. Hallelujah. Let's clap our hands to the Lord. Make a joyful noise. Bibles this morning. Turn to the book of First Kings, chapter seventeen. Amen. It is August the second, uh, I think. August second. Yes. And uh, man, it's been hot. <laughs> See, I was trying to put something out there where I could get a, a just a full houseful amen. So we'll try it again. Man, it's been hot. Amen. 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 There it is. <laughs> it's been it's been pretty dry, yeah. actually, other than last night. Amen. Um, it's been dry, drier than what you might think. If you go on um, later while I'm preaching, if you Google uh, the U.S. Drought Index, <laughs> um, or perhaps sometime after that, uh, for those of you that don't do those sorts of things, but um, U.S. Drought Index, you'll see that in the lower 48 states, there really aren't very many states that don't have at least some area of mild to moderate, drier than normal, mild to moderate drought. Um, it's It's been a dry time. Yes. It's been a dry time. Yes. There's a lot of, there's a lot of promise out in the fields. Um, there's a lot that looks pretty good, but yes. But it's been dry, and uh, a lot of folks stand in a place where they needed to rain on their fields. Yes, amen. And a lot of folks stand in a place where they needed to rain in their life. Amen. Uh, amen. It's been a dry time, yes. and it's time for some relief. And I believe the Lord is going to lead us to that today yes. in the Word of the Lord. Amen. In First Kings seventeen. Scripture says that Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, who was the king. Yeah. The prophet says to the king these words, As the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. 
the prophet speaks to the king. And the word of the Lord came unto Elijah, saying, Get thee hence, get out of here, turn thee eastward, hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord, for he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. The ravens bought, brought him bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Even where God sent him, the brook had dried up. I've come to preach to us this morning about the end of the drought. Mm. The end of the drought. Like mm -mm. Could you put your Bibles down? Just lift up your hands this morning. Open your hearts to the possibility that relief is far closer than what you've imagined. Thank you, Jesus. That there, there is a cloud. There is a cloud ready to open up and release from heaven. Come on, my friend, touch that this morning. I reach out to heaven right now. Jesus, we need you today. Pour that out in this house today, Jesus. Help us, God, this morning. Lord, we praise you. We thank you for it. We believe you today. Hallelujah. Go ahead and clap your hands unto the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. She had done so well to make it so long in times that were so difficult. It seems like it had been three full years since rain had fallen in her land. And all of the subsurface moisture that lingers in the ground had long been depleted. So no harvest of any consequence could have been expected. Yes. <clears throat> In our age and culture of surplus and stockpile and super Walmart and BJ's and Sam's Club and shelves full of stuff everywhere that we go uh, with wanton waste all around us, uh, mostly for the most part having long ago forgotten the generation that survived and fought its way through the Great Depression we find it hard to connect with a world like Scripture was describing in 1 Kings 17. Yes. Not only was she living in a collapsed economy, and I mean a completely collapsed right. economy, with no expectation of any kind of aid from anywhere, because nobody else had anything either. Yes, amen. There was no stimulus on the way. No. They didn't even talk about it, because there wasn't anything to be done. When it didn't rain, people didn't live long. That was the long and the short of it. A drought to us, we look at a drought map of the United States and say, well, who really cares that 48, most of the 48 states have drought going on somewhere? Well, if, if we understood the implication of it. She was not just living in a collapsed economy, she was a widow. That means she had been married, but her husband died. And that's hard. Especially in the culture that she was in. There was nobody to provide for her. And it wasn't just that she was a widow. She was a widowed mother. So not only did she have to find a way to take care of herself, but she had to figure out a way to take care of her little one. And that's really hard to put in perspective until you have one of your own. Amen. Like you can put up with a bunch of stuff and suffer through on your own, but when it's your kid, man, that's that's a whole different deal. This is where she lived. Yet in the face of all the surrounding impossibilities, 
She had managed through three years of severe drought and famine to keep what remained of her family intact. It's absolutely incredible in my mind that one woman by herself could last this long under these conditions. She was a good woman. She was a good mother. But she now stands at a pivotal moment in time. And you read her story if you follow on in 1 Kings 17, picking up where I left off. It tells the story of this woman. And she stood before this prophet with the prospect of making her last meal. What she had so carefully rationed and protected was now down to the last measure. She had prayed, she had studied, she had worked, she had, she had, she had frugalized to the fullest degree to get this far. And even, listen, even in all of her best efforts, being the best mother that she could be, being the best person and the most resourceful human being she could possibly be, she reached her end. We will always reach our end. Amen. Some of us sooner than others, but we're all going to get to a point where if God doesn't intervene, then there is nothing left. Yeah. Standing before her now was a prophet. Not the prophet that we like that comes to pronounce a promise, but he was there to ask something of her. Yes. Uh -huh. Right. Uh -huh. We want the representation of God to show up before us with a hand going this way. Saying, here's yours. Don't get me wrong, I'll take every blessing that, that God wants to send my way. Amen. But in this context, it was a bit different. Yes. God sends a messenger into his life, and the first thing he does is hold out his hand and say, I know, I know what you're doing, but before you do that, make a little cake for me. Oh, yes. And she did what so many people won't do. She didn't try to mask her situation and say, well, sure, everything's fine here. I'll, I'll, I'll go do that. That's what most of us would do. Well, it's bad, but yeah. Well, maybe most of us would. That's what some people would do. <laughs> uh, anyway. Um, she, didn't, she didn't try to hide the fact that, that she didn't have much. Neither did she go on to the the uh, you know drama queen stage that our generation has come to embrace, uh, just 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 giving out every detail of the last twenty years of the hardships of her life. She just told the man how it was. She said, "You know what? Um, I appreciate you being here." I've got about I've got about eight ounces of cornmeal that's four years old, and I'm about to go cook that up with these two sticks that are left, and I'm going to make something a uh, little Debbie for my boy and I. We're going to split it and eat it, and then we're going to die. He said, "Yeah, that sounds good. I'll have some of that." Uh, and she said, "Okay." Sometimes the most generous people are the ones that have the least. Uh huh. Yeah. Just throw that out there. Uh -huh. I know this is slow and difficult this morning and probably a little painful where you're sitting, but let's let's just somebody say praise the Lord. Praise Lord. the Lord. Lord. Amen. Amen. She presented her conversation, her condition to the prophet in no uncertain terms. And he in turn answered with clear direction. Just do what you said. She, he's, he didn't say, lady, you're, you're way off base here. He said, you're on the right track. Yeah, I don't, I'm not here to tell you that anything's different than what you're saying. You're right. Now, go and do as you have said. You're, you're doing all the right things. He didn't say you failed God and that's why you're going through this. Right, he didn't right, say right. You've, you've messed up and, right. and you're Amen. out of the way. Come on. You're the only one going through a drought. He understood. The whole world is dealing with this situation. He said, go and do as you have said, but add to that just one other thing. Cut off a piece of that deal and cook it up for me. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Make me a little cake first. That's all I need. She could not possibly have known that she was one obedient cake bake away from the end of a long dry spell. Come on! It did not appear to be 
me a cakewalk. But friend of mine, what she did next changed her life forever. It changed the future of her family. Just one decision about what she was going to do in the middle of her misery when it looked like all hope was gone. Hey, friend, sometimes that's when you find out everything is on the line. When you've got just a little bit left, that's when God begins to do the most. Amen. She did as she was directed, and immediately for her, the effects of the surrounding drought no longer touched her home. Come on. How about that? The drought wasn't over, but it was over for her. Amen. Amen. I said the drought wasn't over everywhere. It did not rain that day. But for her, the effects of what was going on in the world no longer came inside of her home because she was obedient to the will of God. Yes. She gave the last and the best of what she had. She was able to survive in a world that was dying. She found a place of plenty in a world of emptiness. She received relief in her life when she opened up herself fully to God. Amen. Amen. You'll notice also that it was in her house the national revival found a foothold as Elijah was sustained and strengthened for many days living off the miracle of her obedience. Amen. That's new to me. I thought he was just there, ate this meal, and kind of left. But Scripture says that he was there, and she and he in her house lived many days off a little bit of nothing. Because the promise had come that said, if you do this, that, that meal will not fail. Your cruise of oil is not going to run empty. And he stayed there and he lived in the midst of that miracle as well. The prophet yes. mm-hmm. Shortly, this poor woman was to face even greater tragedy as her son. I mean, this is like, this is like the biggest kick in the guts that you can even imagine. Like, like she has managed to, to survive with her son through all of this economic downturn and yes. famine and drought and everything else, man of God comes. There's a miracle in her home. And she wakes up one morning and finds out today's to be the day that her son passes away. It just... I mean, that's hard stuff. That's hard stuff. But now she would witness an even greater miracle as her son, who was dead, was raised to life again through the prayers of the prophet. Listen, God was able to keep him alive through all of that, and even when his life gave way, God was able to raise him again. And friend, if you follow in Scripture, after they experienced resurrection in her humble home, the man who would declare the end of a nationwide drought rose up and went from her home to face the king. He got to, he he left, listen, he left this place of new life to go stand on a platform of national recognition and was able to lift his voice in a way that brought revival Amen. To everyone around them. Amen. Uh-huh. Friend, we're too small minded when we think we're just trying to get our family to survive. We're too small minded when we think this is just about getting us through the recent and the Come current on. problem. But what God is trying to do is position us for something greater and something bigger when we realize that there's more to this mission. Than us having what we want. National healing began in Israel when the spiritual authority exposed himself to the opposing authority. 
First Kings 18 and 1 says, It came to pass after many days the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show yourself yes. to Ahab, yes. and I will send rain upon yes. the earth. Yes. It would have been easy enough for God, I believe, um, because He's God, and He's really good at doing everything. I think he could have pulled off sending rain without Elijah doing anything. <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty sure he's been doing it for a long time. I don't know that he really needed Elijah's meteorological expertise to go and forecast rain, and then God's able to. It seems like seems like forecasters and God, God and forecasters, somewhere there's there's a breakdown in communication. Anyway. I believe God could have pulled it off without without all of this. But the commandment of the Lord was, Elijah, go and show yourself yeah. to the king. Amen. To the man that directly opposes you. To the man that's yeah. been trying for years to kill you and yeah. to destroy you. To yeah. silence your voice and to remove your influence. He says, go and show yourself to him. Yes. God could have accomplished what He wanted to do in the end, or at least causing rain to come without this confrontation. But doing so would have subverted the whole purpose of the drought to begin with. Sometimes we forget that what's going on in the world isn't just about us. That's right. Yeah. That's and this drought in Israel wasn't just about Elijah, and it wasn't just about the little woman, and it wasn't about her son. It was about things that are bigger than that. Ahab was a king, and he had sinned greatly. Scripture says in a play that he did, he, did, he did more to upset God than anybody else. Like, oh, amen. Now that is not a noble distinction. No, 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 no. <laughs> I mean, it's great to have your name in the Bible, but if it's there for that reason, then it would be better just to yes. scratch that yes. off the list. But he had built, he had set up an altar for Baal, which yes. was a pagan god or idol god. And he built a house for him in Samaria. Like he built a church to an idol. And he supported people going there to worship. But that's what King Ahab did. In the days of King Ahab, the city of Jericho was rebuilt. <clears throat> the one that Joshua fought against. Yes. The battle of Jericho. Yes. The walls came tumbling down. Well, guess what about that city? God said, don't ever let that city be built again. Uh -huh. He said, I smashed that thing. Uh -huh. Don't set it back up. Uh -huh. I put that down. I delivered you from that. Don't ever be let it rebuild again. Well, guess who came along and rebuilt it? It was during Ahab's reign. There was some messed up stuff going on in the world, so God's way of dealing with it was to just shut off the waterworks. Yep. Amen. <laughs> it got people's attention. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's easier to do back then. <laughs> Localized drought or large drought doesn't do much to get people's attention anymore. It takes man does it take some pressure to get people's yeah. attention. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And what God required at the end of all of this was for the spiritual authority to confront the enemy and to confront the opposition. And this is what we run from a lot of times. It's what we run from a lot of times. We have, we have tremendous authority to stand up in truth to stand up for what's right Amen. to stand up for the will of God and not just I'm not even talking about going to city hall or, or capitals or even things like that I'm just telling you as an individual you have authority to stand up against the struggles in your life you have authority to stand against temptation. You have authority to stand against voices that are in opposition to you. We, we have authority, but so much we would rather is, is not look it in the face. We'd rather go on Facebook and, and blast our antics there and never really deal with it and just hope it goes away. <laughs> and it doesn't really work. 
And God said, I'm not going to work that way. Amen. Elijah, I want you yep. to show yourself. Yep. I want you to get out from where you are. We need to confront the sin in our life in order for God to give us victory over it. Does that make sense? Is there an amen in the house? Amen. It doesn't matter how dry it's been. When you, when you begin to confront those issues in your life, God will give you victory. Hiding our condition does no good for anyone. If the widow would have said, yeah, there's no problems here. Yeah, I'll go make you whatever you want. She likely would not have received the provision that she did. She could have been just as broke. But if she would have never exposed that, it's very unlikely that there would have been opportunity to pronounce the miracle that she did. Likely she would have missed out on the resurrection power that she experienced in her home. Listen, we, we have authority to face the opposition. We have authority to stand up. God, especially, especially men, for goodness sake, I don't know what kind of world we're living in, but, but my goodness, God has given us authority as men. He has Amen. made us in His image. We ought to be, we ought to be standing for something. Yeah. Amen. We ought to let, we, not, not being bullies and not putting people down, but my goodness, God has positioned yeah. us to lead our homes, yeah. to lead our families, to walk up rightly before Him, to lead in prayer, to lead in worship. It's just a matter of deciding to stand up and say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to walk in the position that God has given me. And there's nothing to be afraid of. Elijah met Ahab. He meets him out there in the field. I don't know where they were. Dry, dusty field somewhere. And the prophet set the terms for what was going to happen next, not the king. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you would read that and expect that when when Elijah and Ahab meet, it's going to be like it's going to be like the showdown at the OK Corral, and there's going to be guns blazing, and and they're just going to cut him down. And you would have thought it could have been that way. Yeah, could have been. But they didn't. No. It's incredible. To me. Ahab's there with this group of guys. Elijah's all by himself. And Elijah tells the king, this is how it's going to be. You go get your stuff together and meet me up on the mountain. We're about to talk to God. That's what he said. Amen. Friend of mine, if we would approach life a little bit more like that sometimes, we would be a whole lot further down the road. When we realize who we are and what God has given us and the opportunity that we have with God to speak truth and to stand for what's right. You, you'd see a whole lot more stuff falling out of your way if we would just stand up and lean and walk and confront what's before us and deal with it in the will of God. Not in the will of our flesh, but in the will of God. And walk uprightly and talk uprightly and live uprightly rightly and lead a holy life and walk with God in the anointing that He's given us. So from the place of confrontation, they went to the altar. It's a good place to go. In 1 Kings 18, he said, Let, Elijah tells them all how it's going to be done. Yes, sir. Let them give us two bullocks and yep. let those prophets of Baal, there's 400 or 50 of those. 450. Yeah, 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 that's right. It is a pile. They got it. It's more than a football team. <laughs> <laughs> it's he said, get, let them choose out a bullock for themselves, cut it in pieces, lay it on wood, put no fire under it, and I'll do the same thing with mine. Yep. Mm -hmm. You call on the name of your gods, and I'll call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answers by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, "It's that sounds good. Man, he got an agreement out of the whole community. Wow. We need a statesman like that. Listen, for the dry spell to end, they needed an altar. Yes. For the dry spell to end, they needed an altar. They needed an experience at the altar. They didn't just need an altar to look at. They needed an altar where the fire of God came down. Friend, they needed an altar where God moved, where God impacted their life, where God impacted their thinking. It was, listen, the altar is a place of sacrifice. Obviously, first and foremost, that's what an altar is for. They came and they laid sacrifice on the altar. And sacrifice is, is giving something to God. 
It's giving up something for God. It still is the same thing to give a sacrifice. But it wasn't just that. It was a place of dying, yes. But it was also a place of firsts. When we say we're going to the altar, we ought to soon remember that it's that, that the altar that God designed was not to be a place where they brought what was second best, what they used and didn't need anymore, what was left over, or, or what somebody gave to them that they were trying to re-gift. The altar was a place where you brought what was first born, what was first harvested, what was the best that you had, because who in the world wants to give God something second rate? It wasn't what God said when you come to this altar you bring what's first and you bring what's best. Friend, we come to the altar to repent. We come to the altar to pray and do a lot of things but we ought to understand when we say we're giving our life to God when we're putting our life on the altar it's to give Him what is first. The first consideration. The highest level of priority. The first level in order of importance in our life. That's what happens at an altar. Right? Beyond that, it's a place of purity. There wasn't room for anything filthy. There wasn't room for anything dirty. It was a place for all of that to be cleansed away. Scripture says that Elijah took 12 stones and built an altar. Yes. He took 12 stones and built it up. Yes. One for each of the tribes of Israel. Amen. He built an altar. And then the Bible says that he dug in. Yes. It literally does. He dug yep. in at the yep. altar. He, did. Yeah. he dug a trench around it. Yes. He did. Think he about that. I know, that's like that's like a great preacher saying. And <laughs> distracted by the sound effects coming from the great beyond. <laughs> It'll be okay. We'll survive. <laughs> he built an altar up uh -huh. and then he dug in around it uh -huh. friend don't miss that point today he built an altar and then he dug in friend it's time to come to the altar and dig in get entrenched at the altar in other words make it a place where you're not likely to leave in a hurry Make it a place that becomes your sanctuary. Make it a place where things run deep in your life. At the altar. Yes. Amen. Mm. He had 12 barrels of water among the most precious commodities during the drought. And he yes. had it poured over the whole yes. deal. Yes. Yes. You want something to catch fire, the first thing they'll teach you in Boy Scouts is don't pour water on it. Yeah, Maybe it's right. not the first thing I would <laughs> That was the hard Boy Scouts. <laughs> it would make sense to me. <laughs> Your fire's not burning, your wood must be wet. Yes. Hallelujah. <laughs> they poured 12 barrels of water over the whole deal. Oh, and it made, the, it made the beef wet, and it made the wood wet, and it yeah. made the rocks wet, and yeah. it filled the trench. And made, right. Like everything yeah. was wet. Yes. Yes. It's like putting a wet blanket on a church service. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like yeah. preaching too long. Yeah. <laughs> He weighed it down till things were really heavy. Yes. Yeah. Amen. But sometimes it's got to get really heavy yes. before the fire of God yes. comes and makes a difference in your uh -huh. life. Uh -huh. Hey, them other goons were out there. They were carrying on all day long. Oh, yeah. They were. It was a mess. Yeah, they were coming. And they were doing. They were doing. They were messed up in their theology. I mean, first of all, they were they were talking to the wrong God. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Yes. Only one. However, they made a similar mistake to one that's still committed in our day. And they thought that by getting louder, yes. oh boy. Uh -huh. there was a better chance yes. that they would get God's attention. Yes. Uh -huh. That by jumping higher, harder... Uh, doing all kinds of, you know, whatever, destroying things. Yes. Yeah. Now, listen, friends. As, as I've led songs, there are many times where I try to say encouraging things. Amen. Like, let's all clap our hands. Yes. <laughs> Lift your voice a little bit. Yes. Let a hallelujah rise out of your soul. Amen. 
Amen. Things like that to encourage the volume to increase because that's important for us. Uh huh. Right. But I, I would never want to give you the idea that I'm asking you to be louder to try and get the attention of God a little bit better. Because, friend, you've got His full attention. He's waiting on you. What, what, what we do and lifting our hands and all of that, that's good for us. It's good for us to be fully engaged, heart, mind, soul, and strength. It really doesn't do us any good to say we're praising an almighty God and sit there with our fingers folded. Uh -huh. And humming along. Boy, that's a nice song when they sing that. Why don't you sing it that way? You know? You don't have to get every note right. I promise. It'll still work. Not experience. Listen, they thought they, thought they were going to hoop and holler, jump and dance, tear things down, and somehow that would get God's attention. Well, it didn't work. It didn't get their God's attention, and it didn't get Elijah's God's attention. It, 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 just, it just made a mess. Come on. Uh -huh. It just made a mess. Right. It just made a mess. Right. Listen, I don't, I don't know what you want to do when you come to an altar. But I want to come to experience God. Amen. I want to come in a way where I'm presenting myself so that God... Yes. is able to respond. Jesus. And it was such a critical point in their life. Yes. Mm -hmm. We have older call after older call week after week. They had not had one for a long time. Yeah. It's okay. Sometimes we don't understand what a pivotal moment it really is when God's trying to talk to us and call us to an altar. It made all the difference in the world what happened at that altar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The ultimate purpose of the altar on Mount Carmel and the ultimate purpose of the altar at Apostolic Faith Church in Chambersburg, when, when it all boils down, it was about deciding who is God. Mm -hmm. It was about deciding who is God. Amen. Then it was about deciding who is God. Is it Baal or is it the Lord Jehovah? Today, it's about deciding who is God. Amen. Is it you? Is it your problem? Is it your money or lack thereof? Is it something else or someone else going on in your life? Or at this altar, are you going to let God show you His power and authority and for you to make up your mind one more time that He is God of my life? Amen. Mm -hmm. Come on now. Amen. Man, it's been hot. Yeah. Amen. It didn't work. <laughs> The purpose of the altar, then and now, is deciding who is going to be God. Elijah came to the altar that he built. He had, he had soaked it down. Things were heavy. And yes. he lifted his voice. Yes, he did. Amen. And he said, God, oh boy. Lord. show us now. Amen. That they may know. Yes. yes. That there would be no doubt. Yes. Amen. Amen. There wasn't a whole lot of impressive or attention getting in it until the heavens opened and a pillar of fire came in. There's a lot of things that are good. There's a lot of things that don't hurt anything at all, but they're just one thing that we need when we come to an altar. And that's for the power of God to come down and do something transforming in our life. At that altar... God moved a nation to understand that He is God. At an altar at the end of a drought, He touched their hearts in a way. That, at, at an altar at what they didn't know was going to be the end of their three-year-long turmoil, at that altar before one drop of rain fell, God changed the hearts of a whole nation. Amen. Mm-hmm. For the dry spell to be over, we've got to put ourselves in a position to let this God be our God. Yes. 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 Amen. One more thing of importance happened before the drought was broken. Obviously, Elijah had the, had the voice of the false prophets silenced. He took them to the brook and killed them there. But after that, Elijah climbed to the summit of Mount Carmel. I guess they didn't they didn't go clear to the top of Ahab. I'm not sure why, but um, the Bible says that he, he went to the top. 
where he could look and face the west, see out over across the Mediterranean Sea. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel. And it's so impressive what he did to me. It's impressive. Like he obviously had prayed at the altar. Um, and we a lot of times make out like he went up there. And, and probably he did talk to the Lord. But really, all that scripture says that he did, he went to the top of the mountain. He faced the direction that he expected relief to come from. And he fell on his face. Put his face between his knees. He just got down on his knees. Yes. 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 He left the altar where the power and fire of God had fallen. He went to the highest point in his life. Mm -hmm. He went to the most elevated place he could find. And he lowered himself to the ground. He lowered himself to the ground. And he waited. Yes. And he watched. Prayer had taken place in his preparation time at the widow's house and at the altar, but now the highest point in his journey. No words are recorded in Scripture between the prophet and God. He simply said, I'm going to go. I'm going to put myself on my face. I'm going to worship in the direction that I expect God to come from. Yes. It calls to mind the words of the apostle, doesn't it? He said, I keep myself under I bring myself. God had elevated him. And he said, at this elevated point in my life, I'm going to lower my... He, he was literally prostrating himself before the Lord to worship. Yes. And in the midst of his worship, he began to see what he hadn't seen at the altar. Listen, if there's ever going to be an end to the drought in our life, it'll come when we find ourselves on our knees. So your drought will end when you find yourself on your knees before the Lord. Not with, not even so much asking Him. Yes. Just worshiping Him. Yes. Let's stand this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Man, it's hot. Amen. 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 <laughs> The highest point in Elijah's experience became a place of continuing worship. He did. He worshiped a while. He had, he had a helper. He said, I'm going to stay here. You go and look and see if anything happens. He sent him out there. He sent him back seven times. It was in this posture of worship that he saw his answer clearly. Listen, when he was at the altar, he told, he told Ahab, I hear the sound of abundance of rain. It was in his spirit. But when he found himself at a place of worship, of complete surrendered worship, he was able to lift up his eyes. Yes. And see what yes, he couldn't hallelujah. see any other way. Amen. Help us to see, Lord. It was in a place and posture of worship. I was driving up here last night. As I usually do on Saturday evenings. I, if I were a deer and you were trying to hunt me, just come around and sit outside here on Saturday evening. You'll probably get me. <laughs> But it had started to rain. Amen. And I just felt the Lord pressing on my heart. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. The drought is ended. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. The drought is ended. Thank Thank you. Jesus. And I know this isn't pretty today. I was going to preach something totally different. But I believe the Lord wants us to stand up this morning. Not based on what you see happening around you. Certainly not based on what you see in the news and the media and everything else. Listen, I don't know if you've ever taken notice, but God gets really good at doing stuff when it looks like it's impossible. Yes, yes. 
You ever hear about that little fellow named David who went out and fought a giant named Goliath? Amen. Doesn't that seem like upside down odds? Well, it doesn't really bother God. Amen. He's not intimidated by that. Amen. When it seems like things cannot possibly work out. I mean, over and over and over again through Scripture. Pastor was just talking about it with, with Gideon and his, his, his dog lappers and chickens and all that carrying on and all that. It, yeah. Hundreds of thousands versus a couple hundred. God's not intimidated by that. Amen. What drives people absolutely crazy in trying to live for God is when they can't figure out to trust Him uh -huh. Because this is how God works. Right. Amen. He will let things, He will allow things. And it, it just it just tears us apart. We're like, God, why can't you fix it now? Why has it got to be three years till it starts raining? Can't you can't you spring up a well under my garden at least and take care of me so I don't have to feel all of this? Well he could, but he's not going to always. Right. Sometimes he will. Sometimes you're healed and it's right now. Sometimes you're healed and it's down the road. Yes. Yes. Friends, the, I believe the Lord is, is trying to get us to believe yes, today yes. that the drought is over. Yes. Listen, this, this, this little bit I know, drought, drought begets more drought. When it gets really dry... You can have you can have a rain cloud come over and it wants to rain so bad. It'll even be raining up. It, it'll be raining up in the sky. It's literally raining, and before the rain hits the ground, it dries up. That that scientifically happens. That's right. Because it's just so dry. And sometimes we live that way. God's trying to pour out, and we've let our souls get so dry. If you'd reach up a little bit, you might feel it. If you reach up a little bit, you might feel it. But listen, what else I know? What else I know is this. When you move into a season of harvest, it's so absolutely incredible. Because it doesn't matter whether there was a drought or not or what the other conditions were. Right. Find yourself out in the high plains or the Midwest yes. when it's harvest time. Yes. And there there are countless square miles yes. of wheat that are getting ready to harvest. And as that wheat prepares to be harvested, it's it's literally drying out. The crop is in, in order it's it's the end of its life cycle yes. and it's releasing moisture yes. into the air. Yes. And the harvest literally creates its own rainstorm by all of those all of those square miles square acres of crop releasing moisture it it combines with what's in the atmosphere and it creates it creates its own environment a season of harvest a season of harvest changes the atmosphere if we could if we could could you close your eyes and just lift your hands this morning could you let yourself believe today could you embrace the word of the lord no matter how ridiculous it may seem to you right now we are standing at the, in a season of harvest and god the, the atmosphere is changing over i know it's been dry i know it's been hot and hard and difficult i know there's been challenges but Releasing something in his church that is going to change the atmosphere. It's going to change the environment. It's going to change everything that we've noticed around us for so long. There is coming a tremendous shift if we would stand up in authority and power with God. If we would begin to pray as apostolics ought to pray. If we would begin to live with some intensity in our life. Pressing toward the mark. Pressing into the mission. Believing that what's happening in the world is not a mistake, but it's a miracle of God. Yes. To move us. To change us. To prepare us. To bring in a harvest. Come on, somebody. It's time. 
for the drought to be over. It's time for your drought of faith to end right now. Somebody reach up and touch that. Somebody reach up a little higher than where you've been and touch that this morning. The drought of faith in your life is coming to an end. Your drought of hope laying in hopelessness night after night. My friend, that is going to be over. The Lord is getting ready to cloud up all over that. Come on, let him do it right now. Reach out for that right now. I don't know that you really need me to tell you what to do next. You just need to touch that. You need to respond to that. You need to believe that this morning. You need to embrace it. God bless you, Facebook Live. So glad you're with us today.